Hey, we're going to try to have a little bit of fun here this morning with safety and compliance. I'm not sure if that's even possible, uh, but we're going to try to. Fun with safety and compliance? That's at least part of the life of Fleet Safety Services consultant Jeff Davis after starting in trucking as a driver eventually made a career in helping mostly small motor carriers through compliance reviews and other audits conducted by FMCSA and state enforcement partners. Gotta find fun where you can, right? He's who you heard at the top here and you've probably heard his voice before if you're a longtime listener. Davis has been a fixture at the annual conference of the National Association of Small Trucking Companies for years. At the annual event last week, we sat in on the presentation you'll hear excerpted today. It delves into some new audit activity Davis is seeing and slip-ups carriers are making with regard to the fairly new drug and alcohol testing results clearinghouse. Too many carriers, he said, are getting dinged by auditors for violations that are easily prevented, as he tells it. There's a lot happening in terms of the clearinghouse too that Davis rounds up in what follows here. Certainly germane to those of you in the audience who employ or lease with one or more drivers or owner operators and the independents that have to do the limited query self checks annually. Also, after Davis's talk, today we'll dive into my Small Fleet Champ Awards presentation Thursday night at the big record setting group of NASTIC attendees. According to President David Owen, the association's attendance for its annual conference this year nearly doubled prior year's registrations. Truly something to behold. I can attest with my own eyes the ballroom where the Thursday event occurred was much bigger at the Omni Hotel than past year's venue at the Sheraton. And it was packed to the gills. What was it like sharing the achievements of finalists Hallahan Transport and Professional Transportation Services? and the ultimate small fleet champ winner in Silver Creek Transportation? Well, stay tuned. Before I hand it off to Fleet Safety Services Jeff Davis with a fix for the most common drug and alcohol violation going, here's a quick word from Overdrive Radio's sponsor. First Guard provides commercial truck insurance to leased owner operators done right. As we've done for more than 80 years, we provide physical damage and non-trucking. Many companies make you pay up to six months of insurance premiums up front, but not First Guard. We bill monthly, so you get quality insurance without needing to pay a lot of cash up front. Go to firstguard.com. That's one S-T guard.com. First Guard, we speak trucker. Let's talk. Here's Jeff Davis, everybody. There are some changes coming about. We look, we think regulatorily, we're going to start seeing a lot more changes coming our way. And my job, uh, what I do is I try to stand in that gap uh, between the enforcement agencies and the motor carriers, trying to help them out so they can stay successful. You know, I've been at this way too long and um, probably should have been out of it years ago, but what what has really changed over this landscape in the last couple of years is there's so much riding on safety that was never riding on safety and compliance before uh 10 years ago if you had an adverse audit or an adverse roadside inspection 11 12 years ago uh you could uh throw it in a trash can no harm no foul until one day they came knocking in fact i really go way back to when i was driving I used to get rung up at the scales at Oak Grove, Missouri, every time I went through there. And there was a gal there, this is how old I'm dating myself, there was a gal in there that ran the scale and she had flowers hanging around the outside of that scale house. And every time she'd ring me up with something and every time I was grinding the gears to get back on the highway, I'd take that piece of paper and I'd toss it right outside the window. Cause it never went anywhere. And now just look how things have changed. You know, we know the next morning, uh, if you use the compass portal, which is different than the SMS scorecard, if you use the compass portal, you can see that roadside inspection the next day if the inspector uploaded before he went off duty, okay? So that's how much things have really changed. Out of your companies represented here, who has had a good roadside inspection this week? Okay, quite a few, all right. Out of those people represented in this room, how many have had a roadside inspection with a violation this week? 
Come on now. We've got 20 clean ones and none with any violations. Well, I stayed up all night and I looked at your CSA score card and I'm not sure that's true. But look at this dude here, okay? This guy, this came in last week, okay? And I called the inspector and I said, are you in the hospital? And he goes, well, I'm about ready to go for writer's cramp. But this driver had 17 violations. It was a two pager. I don't know if you've ever seen one this long. I don't see him that long too much, but it's all triggered by the very first item. What was he doing? Hand, handheld mobile phone, okay? That's what triggered the inspector to look at all these wonderful things from page one to page two, okay? I don't know how the truck was stopping. It must have been a Flintstone, you know, sticking his feet out the, through the floorboard trying to get it slowed down. But a little bit of everything, you know, if the problems, IRP problems, no DOT number, brakes, 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 brakes. And then the inspector, which is sort of cut off on this picture, you can't see it here, but the very last violation was motor carrier needs knowledge of the federal motor carrier safety regulation. So I'm thinking after 16 violations, you got to pour that one on. So if you've had a roadside inspection this week and you had a, a defect, don't feel so bad because there's some people out there really having a bad day. Uh, just amazing that I'm seeing stuff like that these days, but uh, in any effect, we are. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is the clearinghouse. Some changes that have come about recently with the clearinghouse. And just for a quick review, I think everybody's up to speed on this, but I want to go through the basics one more time because I see it as a very high violation rate. I, all I do basically work with DOT audits, and I see this violation coming up time and time again. In the clearinghouse, all right, there's two types of queries, all right? There's a full query that must be done at the time of employment. <coughs> then the motor carrier is also required to do a limited query once every 12 months on every drive. If you're a one truck independent owner operator with motor carrier authority, it's those limited queries that you're required to perform through the clearinghouse annually on yourself as a driver. Search DOT Clearinghouse Self-Check at overdriveonline.com to pull up a walkthrough on the process that we published as the clearinghouse had just come online. For those of you employing drivers, the violation Davis is seeing come up over and over and over again in audits he's helped uh, his small carrier clientele through involves that full pre-employment query, which he describes here as not just your run-of-the-mill minor violation. Rather, auditors consider this an acute violation. It can be one that moves you farther along toward a conditional safety rating, in other words, something no carrier can afford today for long. I'll tell you how the FMCSA, or as I refer to as the agency, handle this. If they come in and you have operated a driver, utilized a driver, without having that full query in your hand, just like the drug test, remember, we cannot utilize a driver until that driver, you have a negative test in your hand or, or you've got a copy of it, okay? The same applies for the clearinghouse. In other words, you can't do a negative drug test, put the driver in operation, and then a couple days later, do the full query. Wow. And if you are found discovered for that violation, the FMCSA considers that an acute violation, okay? Just like operating a driver without a negative drug test. They're one and the same. So be very, very careful with that. Now, the problem is when a driver comes in, most of them, maybe it's starting to turn the corner a little bit, but most of them have never logged into the clearinghouse. To do a full query, the driver has to log on, get a login and a password to the clearinghouse. They, he literally, or she checks the authorization with the FMCSA to release drug testing information. And that is an online authorization. Very, very important. So in the recruiting process, 
if we're trying to get a driver in a truck, one of the very first things that we've done in the past is we get the application. If we're fortunate enough to interview the driver, we interview the driver. And one of the first things that we've always done is get a copy of the motor vehicle record, right? Because you got to know what you're dealing with. You got to know the driver's insurable. Then secondly, on top of that, we came up with, you know, we need to get a negative drug test on this driver before we operate him. And the third thing is we need to make sure that that driver has registered in the clearinghouse and authorized our company to take a look at his alcohol and drug testing history. If you make the mistake and get the cart before the horse and a week later or the day of orientation, if you bring him back for orientation and they finally log into the clearinghouse, and find out there is prohibited behavior in there, you're sunk, you've wasted all that time and effort. So I really encourage you out of the gate to put that in your early pre-qualification process. It'll save you a lot of time. Yes. A question then came from the back of the room. Are you saying you can't do the pre-employment drug test before the driver completes the authorization in the clearinghouse? No, what I'm saying is you can go ahead and do the pre-employment drug test at any time you choose to, if you're going to hire the driver. What I'm saying is before that driver operates, you have to have the full query back in your hand stating that there's no prohibitive behavior or performance with that driver. Got it? Very, very important. The backups and other timing issues here for small fleet owners are compounded by the necessity of the newly hired driver getting into the clearinghouse with their own account and granting consent for the full query, of course. When it comes to the limited query though, consent is handled between the company and the driver. The question arose as to the proper language of that consent form, whether sample language might be available via NASTIC or other sources. Here's what Davis said on that. I don't know if NASTIC produces one, but there on the Clearinghouse website, there's a couple of samples on there um, that you can look at and possibly ta tailor to your, your usage. Now, that is for the limited query. <clears throat> for the full query, that authorization is between the driver and the FMCSA. Okay? Good. We've got about 95, last count, 95,850 positive drug tests in the database, okay? Sounds like a lot. See some people shaking their head. Uh, maybe around 1% or so of the drivers that we have out there are active. But think about what this industry is doing. I bet you we can go to manufacturer after manufacturer after manufacturer around this city and I bet you we find hardly anybody testing randomly. And on top of that, I don't think we're gonna to find too many that are testing at a 50% rate, all right? 1%'s a lot. 100,000, let's say we're at 100,000 now. About six months ago, we thought we'd see that thing playing out. More and more carriers are getting registered. More and more people are, are presenting information to the clearinghouse, so on and so forth. However, we still have a little trajectory going on here that's a little concerning. So we're not sure where that thing's going to level. Uh, one last thing, and then I'll get off the clearinghouse. We can talk all hour on the clearinghouse, and I'm sure we got better things to do. But um, what we see with the clearinghouse, too, is be very, very careful about your post-accident testing. Make sure that a post-accident test is required. And what I mean by that is, for a post-accident test to be implemented, it's gotta be a hearse, nurse, or hook type accident, right? Fatal injury or any vehicle tow, and, 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 and your driver must be sighted, okay? Then you are required to do post-accident testing. Quick clarification here. If the crash involves fatality, the hearse in Davis's hearse, nurse, or hook triumvirate, as it were, if it's a fatality crash, the driver requires a post-accident test whether or not he or she is sighted. Davis gets to that clarification of what follows, but for anybody who missed that, I thought I'd get that marker in here now. I've worked with a number of our clients that have jumped the gun and tested when post-accident testing was not required, 
That pot, and they ended up testing positive. That positive test went right to the clearinghouse. So now you've got some employment law issues. Fatality, it is required in all fatality crashes. Uh, with an injury or a tow, the driver must be cited for post-accident testing to take place. Yes. Next question that came up on the pre-employment query, if I did not do it, is there a way to correct that? <laughs> Depending on the enforcement venue that looks at you, it may or may not be cited, okay? What I suggest that you do is continue to do that now. And the purpose behind that, what enforcement is, has relayed to me, is that at least authorizes the FMCSA to spread their drug testing history around to whoever asks, okay? So um, it's sort of like safety performance history checks. Your past employment inquiries, supposed to have three attempts, good faith effort within the first 30 days. Well, if the driver's been there six months and you've never done it, should you still do them? You know, that's a question we're always faced with, okay? Because you're still probably decided even if you do them late. Good idea to do them late. All right. I have a question. Yes. So I just want to make sure I understood what you said as far as the uh, post-accident testing. Mm -hmm. If there's no fatality, then you do not have to do that? All fatalities have to have a post-accident test. Right. But if a driver is involved in a crash where any party is <coughs> injured and removed from the scene or any vehicle is towed, mm -hmm and your driver receives a citation, then is when post-accident testing must be performed. If your driver does not receive a citation, you are not required to post-accident test. Okay, everybody clear? Davis reiterated the consent protocols for full pre-employment and ongoing limited queries of the clearinghouse required by law then, stressing that. The authorization on the limited is what I call manual, it can be digital, but that's something between the motor carrier and the driver. The other authorization is between the FMCSA and the driver. And again, this is just full and, and uh, full query and pre-annual uh, verification of the alcohol testing database. Now you're saying, now wait a minute, Uncle Fred's <coughs> driven with me for 25 years and you're telling me that I've got to uh, do a limited query on him once a year. Well, the reason for that, the only reason we can come up with is the fact that um, if Uncle Fred goes down the street and applies for a job and ends up being dirty down there, and then you would find that. Outside of that, I'm not sure why we're doing limited. Maybe somebody smarter than me knows the answer, but uh, here's one that, we, a query that was done, the driver had no pro prohibited behavior, that's what we're looking for. And here's a motor carrier that didn't do it in a, uh, in a compliance review. Uh, they didn't register for the clearinghouse and everybody uses the excuse, hey, the thing blew up. I could speak 30 minutes on why the clearinghouse blew up, okay, but it's not worth it. I, this thing that happened was a tremendous fiasco, all right, just from a programming point of view. but. What's funny is if I get in the middle of an audit, guess what? The second day of the audit, that motor carrier somehow got registered for the clearinghouse, which they hadn't been able for the last year. So here's a carrier that didn't get registered and they got registered, failing to do a pre-employment query, 800 bucks, no limited query, 800 bucks. Those are per driver fines after an audit that Davis is referencing there. Some states are doing it by driver. So if you have four drivers that require a limited query and you don't have that done, they'll multiply that times four. All right. All right. We've got some new regulations concerning the clearinghouse. Just came out recently. Uh, goes into effect 11-8, uh, all right. The FMCSA has published in the Federal Register that now state agencies must access the information in the clearinghouse to check for prohibited behavior. And if they find prohibited behavior in the clearinghouse, they cannot issue, renew, or reinstate any CDL until that driver 
it has completed the return to duty process. Okay, this is new. Uh, they have to remove the CDL privilege and downgrade the CDL. What's the other way we can get a ground date, uh, a downgraded CDL? Anybody know? What with the medical? Well, that, but what about, what do you have to do with the medical? That medical, the, the, the federal government, FMCSA, has married the medical card and the CDL. If a medical card is not placed administratively on the CDL, that CDL is no longer a CDL, it's a car license. If that's discovered in an audit, you are cited for operating a commercial motor vehicle without a CDL. So your driver gets, every time your driver gets a, a renewed medical, the driver must take it to the BMB, Bureau of Motor Vehicles, Clerk of Courts, whatever you have, and get it placed electronically on the license. You can send it into the state. You're, you're more than welcome to do that. Most states have that. The problem with that is there's another requirement in the regulations that within 15 days of every medical, the motor carrier has to obtain a full MVR. You got to go out and buy a motor vehicle record showing that that new medical information has been placed on the CDL. If you don't do that, that's an acute violation. Now, June 21st, 2018. Hold her up for a minute. I'll get, just let me finish this up. June 21st, 2018, uh, the federal government said, we are going to take over this process. As soon as the medical leaves uh, the clinic, it's going to go right to the CIDLIS database. Once it goes to the CIDLIS database, <coughs> you're not going to have to do a thing. All right? Uh, they missed that deadline. So they said, you know what? Instead of postponing it for a couple weeks, we're going to postpone it for three years. So their next deadline was June 21st, 2021. Well, lo and behold, two weeks before that deadline, guess what? We can't get the states to cooperate with us. So we're not going to extend it for one year. We're not going to extend it for two years. We're not going to extend it for three years. We're going to extend it for four years. Folks, it's the most important thing you can do in the driver qualification process is make sure that that CDL is not downgraded. So two ways to do it now. There might be more, but in the area of regulatory. One, by not ensuring that that medical is placed on the motor vehicle record. And remember, you have to have proof in the driver qualification file that that change happened. That's one way. And the other way is if you have prohibited behavior in the database, uh, then that CDL will be downgraded until they do the return to duty process. Those downgrades are required of states by 2024, but the rule is in effect as of today, as Davis noted. Given state lag on marrying the medical card to the CDL that he referenced, it feels to me unlikely at the least that many states get their systems together to effectively implement the clearinghouse checks quickly. They also changed the actual knowledge, and this is getting a little technical, but these are one of the reasons, one of the ways that you can implement drug testing. Uh, something you can see with direct observation, information from previous employers, a traffic citation while operating a CMV under the influence, and an employee admission. That's what the old rule said. They clarified point three in this latest regulatory release. And what it says is, even if the driver is not convicted of the DUI or operating under the influence, uh, that offense cannot be changed in the clearinghouse regardless of whether or not it's thrown out of court. So even if your driver is not a driver, is not uh, proven as guilty, or is he proven as innocent, that is gonna stay on 
the clearinghouse and has basically removed this regulation that allows drivers to remove that. Now, I made a statement about that the driver must complete the return to duty process. And the clarification on that falls like this. Um, when a driver tests positive at any, in any situation, if that driver is disqualified to drive anywhere, if that driver wants to become qualified to drive again, they must go to a substance abuse professional and get an evaluation. And then once they get an evaluation, they must do a return to duty drug test. A return to duty drug test is nothing more than a glorified pre-employment drug test called a return to duty, uh, re return to duty test, except for the fact it's done by direct observation. The minimum requirements a substance abuse professional must suggest is six follow-up tests in the next 12 months. It could be six tests for the next three years. So the driver doesn't have to complete all those steps. What the driver has to complete is the evaluation of the return to duty test and then begin the follow-up testing and then that driver can be placed in service. However, that is going to stay in the clearinghouse regardless of whether or not the citation is uh, thrown out of court. Okay, change. Hopefully that's helped for those of you employing drivers and or leasing with fellow truck owners out there. Now, finally, as promised, a bit of a window for you on the Small Fleet Champ Awards presentation last week Thursday here in Nashville at NASTIC's annual conference, an evening banquet presentation. I'm not used to speaking to hundreds of people live and in the flesh like that, let it be known. Usually I'm the guy running around taking pictures and taking notes while somebody else is doing that. So. Go easy on me for this first one. Here's a big thanks to David Owen for his magnanimous intro and outro, which you'll hear. And I do hope you enjoy as much as I did the recognition delivered to each of the finalists. And take heart from the final remarks of Jason Cowan, owner of Silver Creek Transportation, this year's Small Fleet Champ. Catch plenty of scenes from the event too if you haven't yet via overdriveonline.com. This room is a living proof that the American dream still exists in the United States. So with that, I'm going to move along and introduce, we are so happy to have become a major sponsor for Overdrive, Overdrive Magazine's Small Fleet Championship. This is the second year, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, I, a good friend of ours, it's a guy that supported us when we had probably less than a thousand members and has always been a friend of ours, Todd Dills, who's I think the editor now of Overdrive Magazine. Todd, are you here? Yeah. Yeah. Hard act to follow, guys. Anyways. Um, like, like David said, my name's Todd Dills, and uh, editor of Overdrive, and I'm really glad to be doing this, uh, this Small Fleet Champ uh, unveiling of our winner and recognition of our finalists uh, in a live setting, because uh, the first year we did it was last year, and started uh, taking the entries, you know, sometime around February uh, 14th, Valentine's Day, somewhere around there, and uh, very quickly realized that uh, this program probably wasn't gonna go the way we thought it was gonna go. Um, when, uh, when, when COVID happened and all the ramifications uh, of that uh, occurred last year. But, uh, glad to be back here uh, in person for sure. I'll tell you a little bit about, um, about why we, uh, we started the program. So Overdrive is celebrating its uh, 60th anniversary this year. And so it's been around quite a long time. Since its founding has been uh, focused uh, principally in terms of the, the audience that we have uh, the audience that we have is made up mostly of one truck uh, motor carriers, uh, some leased uh, one truck uh, owner operators as well. Uh, but of course, within that, uh, anybody that owns a truck is a one truck motor carrier, inevitably uh, a good percentage of them go on and add trucks. And, and, and we felt we had an owner operator the year program, one truck 
ago. We've had some company driver of the year programs for, with some of our affiliated magazine, uh, our affiliated magazines, but we've never had uh, that recognition program for you know the, the small fleet owner. And so, and so this small fleet champ award is you know, intended to recognize that that one truck guy that moves beyond that single truck and and really commits to commits to the business and, and grows the fleet. Um, and you know, it's, it, it sticks around uh, as well. So a lot of the judging is, is based not just on growth and income and financials, but on you know the the, the sense that uh, the owners here stay. Um, so before before we get to, to this year's uh, finalist, I wanted to Nancy was kind enough to to invite you know, all of our finalists from last year uh, to this event since uh, la last year the the, the prize. Uh, there was there was no fun trip included, you know, and uh, a really, really big thanks, really big thanks uh, to Dave and all the crew at NASIC for that. Um, the winner last year wasn't able to be here. He's out in Central Point, Oregon. Uh, his name is James Davis. He, he runs James Davis Trucking, uh, really uh, mostly flatbed and carrier, and they're a really really fast growing company. Um, great bunch, but I, this year we do have uh, the other two finalists. Uh, one of whom uh, is. Uh, is based down in Simsboro, Louisiana. He's an oil services related hauler primarily. They do a little, little bit of flatbed work too, but mostly it's, it's bulk uh, liquid tank. Uh, and his name is John McGee and he runs John McGee Trucking. Uh, he's been able, I, I know he's had a pretty good year in the last year, so I've been able to grow a little bit, um, but uh, I encourage you to talk to him after this is over. John, if you could stand up, you and Brenda, Brenda McGee is, is with him here too. You recognize that? Everybody give her a Ask him, ask him about the, um, uh, the disaster relief work he, he put in uh, with uh, several of his trucks uh, down in Slidell, I believe, uh, after Ida this week, I mean, this year. It was, um, it was pr pretty interesting stories there. So the other finalist is uh, the folks from Ed Burns and Sons Trucking. Um, the fact that they're able to be here this year is, is kind of, um, it, it's uh, especially meaningful, I, I feel like, because um, uh, and, and sad uh, because they are uh, the founder of the company, Ed Burns, who, who started the uh, started the fleet some 75 years ago. Uh, passed away on July 4th and couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't be here to see uh, see this. But um, his sons, um, his sons Mike and Terry Burns, uh, and, and and their families are here. Um, I wonder if you guys could stand up as well. Uh, Say hi to the crowd. It's, uh, it's great, great to see you here. Uh, does, anybody, is anybody ready to rumble? Somebody told me that's trademarked. I can't really say it, you know, in the way that he says it. But uh, anyways, for for a competition that his prize, one of his one of his prizes, a title belt like a heavyweight champ, I, I thought it was uh, maybe appropriate. Okay. Anyway, el eligibility this year. Um, you had to be operating uh, with, motor, with motor carrier authority over the last four full calendar years. You had to be operating with three or more Class A trucks, uh, four higher freight. Uh, you had to operate no more than 30, so three to 30 is in that sweet spot. Sweet spot. Um, and, um, and you couldn't have been John or Ed or James Davis trucking. Um, and, you know, each of the finalists, uh, like I sort of, like I mentioned, I think I may have mentioned this. Uh, we get some years worth of NASIC membership. Um, they get recognition tonight, trip here to Nashville, and, uh, and the winner's gonna get two years of membership and, of course, the belt. So we started, we started entries a little bit later than we did last year, and uh, we, got, we got dozens of them, though. It was, it was everything from you know, power-only carriers in a, in, a, uh, in a kind of a reefer system uh, to uh, lot, several reefer, Carriers uh, all across the map, really aggregate haulers and, and everything else. Um, we narrowed, narrowed those. Uh, I want to say it was like six, seven dozen, down to a group of ten uh, semifinalists. After we sent out a follow-up uh, request for more information, um, examined operating information, detailed financials, and much more supplied by each fleet. And uh, editors from Overdrive and our sister publication CCJ, which is more of a fleet focus. Some of you folks. 
I probably uh, probably read read some of that. Uh, and then we interviewed each fleet owner, wrote a, wrote a little bit of a profile of the business. And you know, during that process, we had a panel of eight different judges among the editors and a few other associates around trucking. And we rated each fleet on a scale of one to 10 uh, to determine the three finalists. And again, the criteria were growth, uh, solid financials, um, and just kind of some of the in intangibles um, you know, in terms of uh, giving back to com community, uh, commitment to, to trucking long term. And uh, so, our finalists this year. Here we go. Uh, the first is Halhan Transport uh, out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, represented today by Rob Halhan and his wife, Karen. If you guys could come to the stage. As, as the owner of this drive-in pulling fleet, Rob Hellahan, in a way, exemplifies the mission of this contest to a T, in that he was a one-truck owner-operator with his motor carrier authority as recently as the year of 2017. Since that time, he has expanded his company multifold and now operates, a, now operates an eight-truck fleet. He's done that by building very close freight relationships with brokers, and some direct customers, maintaining a top-notch safety profile all the while, and much more. With a mix of company equipment and owner-operators leased on, he's also shown a commitment to being a hand up for the next generation of those like him, who have a drive to take ownership of their own truck and business. We spoke to one of Rob's closest freight partners, the Chicago-based broker, that does a good job of keeping him anonymous, right? He said, uh, he said, if Hallahan had 100 trucks, I'd want him on all of my loads. I know he's going to do what needs to be done. The broker lauded Hallahan too for close communication, clear investment in the relationship. In our industry, he said, there's a lot of hectic stuff that goes on. No doubt, right? He's always very punctual. Anytime I need something, he responds right away. <laughs> Rob and Karen Hallahan. So, second, uh, I'd like to invite up to the stage uh, Jason and Penny Callen of Silver Creek Transportation out of Henderson, Kentucky. So, Silver Creek President Jason Callen and his team, including two sons now closely involved in the business, sitting right over there, uh, set growth goals with a clear plan in recent years that allowed them to span, expand to 24 trucks. After having the, its origins hauling aggregates after the purchase of another small trucking company in the 1990s, Silver Creek determined that no one customer would make a majority of its freight as its recipe for stability and long-term growth. With their current 24 trucks, the fleet now moves food-grade plastics, alloys, and special machines and equipment with a trailer fleet of both pneumatic and liquid tankers, but also dry vans, flatbeds, low boy trailers as well. Callan told my colleague Jason Cannon for Cannon's profile of the business that, quote, our business is built on specializing in the special. We spoke to a small manufacturer for whom Silver Creek has been a godsend for companies willingness to grow right alongside the young manufacturing business. As a new business, that company was having issues getting carriers that are bigger to service them. The shipper put it this way, we just weren't a priority to the bigger companies. Yet, they found a prime partner in Silver Creek when the company launched a new product that required pneumatic tankers instead of the usual dry vans, they said Silver Creek actually went out and bought dry bulk tankers for us. They really got whatever that whatever it takes attitude with plenty of flexibility. They are number one carrier by far, and I mean way far. They do almost everything for us now. Silver Creek Transportation. <laughs> and finally, uh, from out in, in White City, Oregon, uh, Professional Transportation Services Incorporated owner, Nick Hewitt. <laughs> Hewitt Hewitt's wife, uh, Ruth, couldn't be with us here today. She had a prior conflict, and I do want to say that it's her birthday tomorrow, so everybody wish her a happy birthday. So Hewitt's long road to his current 14-truck, low-profile, step-deck pulling Professional Transportation Services company culminates a career building on his grandfather's legacy with early truck builder Hewitt Trucks. Apparently, trucking was and is my blood, Hewitt told me when we talked for a profile that I wrote in the business last month. 
He has been driver, owner operator, leased fleet owner, dispatcher, sales agent, and much more. With PTSI, his trucking mastery manifests itself with above average income and revenue for drivers and owner operators, 100% company paid benefits for employee drivers, and so much more. We spoke to a specialty agricultural equipment manufacturer in Oregon for whom PTSI hauls most of the company's cross country freight, according to that manufacturer's owner. For at least the last four years, anyways. Not only are those longer hauls, but this is what the shipper himself called quote unquote ugly freight, right? No shortage of securement puzzles that come right along with it. While the manufacturer wasn't effusive in any way with his praise, I feel like he hit the nail right on the head with this no nonsense commendation. I never have to worry about them keeping it on the trailer. Their service has been excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, your f small fleet champ finalists. Here, a Nastic rep paraded the championship belt down in front of the stage in the style of, yes, a ringside rep at a heavyweight title belt, before handing it up to me. The winner is, uh, is behind this small piece of, of paper. <laughs> and so, I'm gonna unveil it. Um, I'm gonna look at it first for myself. <laughs> okay. And the winner is Silver Creek Transportation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Silver Creek owner Jason Cowan from the stage, followed by some remarks from NASTIC President David Owen. We just want to say thank you to everybody in here because, you know, it's, we, nobody does anything by themselves. And so one of the core principles that we have and we believe is that we're all in this together. And this team behind me, they have worked hard. I'm going to cry, is that okay? But all you guys and ladies out here have too, and it makes us proud to be out on the road with you every day. And uh, we just want to lift trucking back to where maybe some of us remember it years ago and do what we can uh, to promote the industry. And just to be on the stage with these guys, it's an honor and a blessing. And uh, I thank you and I thank all you guys too. Because nobody does it by themselves. And so we thank you. Thanks to all, all these folks, and I'm, I'm going to encourage everyone in this room, if you're, if you're under 30 trucks, if you're 30 or less, uh, this time uh, by the end of the year to keep a lookout on, on overdriveonline.com for the small fleet entry form. We're going to do this again. We're going to start it early again this year. It's going to be uh, more involved and, and better program, I think, this coming year, uh, as it's been the last couple, but would encourage you to enter. Um, and also, read about these folks. There's a lot more detailed um, storytelling about them at overdriveonline.com and then slash small hyphen fleet hyphen champ. So take a look at it. Thank you. A big thanks to Nastic too. You know, it's a fact that almost all long haul trucking companies start with one truck. That's that American dream I was talking about. And I don't know how in the world they keep coming. We started a, what we call our new entrance survival training class 12 years ago, Homer. 12 years ago. We teach, I teach it, I, have, I get the opportunity to spend a day and a half with folks like this, usually guys that have, some that don't even have their authority yet, uh, many that have one truck, and most of them have less than five. And it's, it is, it, it's been, I, have, I can tell you, I've had a lot of fun in my life, and I've lived a long life, and I've got a really good memory. This is the most fun I've ever had, with the exception of mine. <laughs> and 
And I want to tell you something else I've discovered over the years. Um, the safest, most profitable business model in long haul trucking is one guy, one truck, and one trailer. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with additional support from Overdrive Extra contributing writer Paul Marhofer, Overdrive News Editor Matt Cole, Social Media Coordinator Holly Young, and Executive Editor Alex Lockey. Um, the safest, most profitable business model in long haul trucking is one guy, one truck, and one trailer. Till next time, keep it pro out there.